Okay, so hi everyone once again. Today we have uh, Yiming Chen from uh, Princeton University. Uh, Yiming will talk about pulling out the island with modular flow. He is a PhD student in Princeton University and he works in the fields of gauge gravity duality and black holes and string theory among other topics. So over to you, Yiming. Okay, uh, thanks a lot for the opportunity for me to speak and uh, Upon request, I'm going to talk about a paper that I wrote a, few, a while ago in 2019, which is based on the recent development on the black hole information problem. Uh, and the title of my talk is Pulling Out the Island with Modular Flow. So I will start with a somewhat long uh, introduction and review. First, I will review the black hole information paradox, and then I will review relevant concepts of uh, integral wedge reconstruction. So let me first start with the black hole information paradox. So as Hawking famously shown that if you consider the quantum fields propagating on a black hole background, the black hole actually emits Hawking radiation, the thermal radiation. And here I'm drawing schematically the parallel diagram of an evaporating black hole. So there are radiation that goes out to the spatial infinity. And Hawking's calculation suggests that if you look at the quantum state of the Hawking radiation, he says that the radiation is in a thermal state. This is a calculation that is done entirely within the semi-classical analysis, namely that we just consider quantum field theory propagating on the uh, fixed space-time background. And a way to characterize that the state being thermal is to compute its entropy. So here I'm plotting the entropy of the radiation with the function of t. Since as the time increases, there are more and more radiation and the entropy of the thermal state increases with the number of degrees of freedom. Uh, following Hawking's discussion, we will find that the entropy of the radiation will grow with time, eventually reach to a, a maximum after the black hole evaporates completely. However, imagine that we start uh, to form the black hole in a pure state then unitarity of quantum mechanics suggests that the final state must also be a pure state. Namely, the final state after the black hole evaporates completely should not have any entropy, or the fine grained entropy of the final state should also be zero. That would suggest that the radiation, the entropy of the radiation should instead following a curve that is called the unitary page curve. Namely, initially it, it does go up, but after a while, at, at this turning point, which is called the so-called page time, it should turn down again and eventually reach zero at, after the black hole evaporates completely. So the, the puzzle for the past few decades is, of course, how do we really compute this fine-grained gravity, uh, fine-grained fine entropy in quantum gravity? And what are we really missing? in the Hawking's calculation that we get this wrong answer, which increases over time. So naively, before 2019, one might have the following expectations. To really compute the fine grained entropy of the Hawking radiation, one would need to be able to compute order e to the minus s, well, s here is the black hole entropy. So it's some non-perturbative corrections to the s matrix that you uh, relating the matter that you throw in and the radiation that comes out. So you might, be, you, you might think that you need to compute this very fine-grained data to the S matrix. Another thing that you might need, you expect you need to do is that you need to be able to sum all these corrections and eventually compute the entropy. And the entropy is a notoriously very difficult quantity to compute in general. However, a huge surprise that happened in 2019 and, uh, uh, it, is that it appears that one does not need to know any of this to compute and this unitary page curve, to compute the entropy that goes up and down again. And one can compute this page curve just within semi-classical gravity, but with a somewhat smart formula. Okay. So, the idea of computing fine grained entropy in holography, of course, dates back to uh, much earlier before 2019. And it first started with the so called Ru Takayanaki formula. So, here, let me review a little bit what the Ru Takayanaki formula is. Here on the right, I'm drawing schematically a 
um, uh, ADS space time. So here I'm drawing it in ADS3. So the vertical direction is the time direction and the spatial direction is the sp spatial slice of ADS, which are here I replace this by a punk ray disk. And the root Takayanagi formula says that if I want to compute the entropy of a spatial subregion A on the boundary, namely here it is a circle. So if I want to compute the, this subregion A, the entropy of this subregion A, I can compute it through gravity by consider a surface gamma A in the bulk that is homologous to the boundary, boundary region A. And I extremize over the area functional of this uh, surface gamma A. Namely, I take the area of gamma A divided by 4G and I look for the extremum. If there are multiple extremums, I'm supposed to choose the uh, extremum that is the minimum. And then the entropy is given by this formula. This formula has been uh, generalized in various ways that are uh, very important in the further development in 2019. One particular generalization is that here in the first formula, I'm considering just the contribution from the classical geometry. But in general, we should also take into account of the quantum fields the contribution to the entropy from the quantum fields propagating on the background. So once you take that into account, um, the formula gets modified such that there is an extra term. So you have the area of the surface plus a bulk entropy in the small region little a. The region little a is just the region that is bounded by the surface gamma a and the boundary region a. Okay, so here I shaded the, this little a region in, in orange. And you take the sum of the area plus the, the entropy of the bulk quantum fields in the region A. Then you take the extremum of this combination. Again, if there are multiple, um, multiple minimums, multiple extremums, you look for the minimum one. So this formula extends the original root Takayanagi formula into the semi-classical regime. Namely, we also consider the contribution of the quantum fields on the background. Now, another important ingredient that, became, uh, that, that, uh, that is important in the recent development is the phenomenon of the so-called islands. So what exactly is the island? The island is simply that in some situation, one might need to be careful that this gamma A might contain a disjoint uh, component, for example, as I'm uh, drawing here. So other than the gamma A that is just attached to the boundary, you could have, for example, a closed surface in the bulk, which includes also some, some uh, pieces of little a, okay? And in general, we need to consider that possibility as well. And once you consider that possibility, the equation gets, uh, uh, becomes a little bit more complicated for the area, you need to take into account this boundary surface gamma A as well as the gamma island, which surrounds the island region. And for the bulk entropy, importantly, here, we, we, the, the, the entropy that we want to compute is the entropy of the region little a that I drew earlier and this region, which I'm denoting as the island inside the bulk. Okay, and importantly, the entropy that we are computing is not just the sum of the two entropy, S bulk of A plus the S bulk of island, is the, the, the entropy of the union of the two. So is there a question? Yeah, hi. Uh, I have a question about uh, this A being, uh, is it necessary? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yes. Yeah, so uh, I've seen that uh, there are in ADS2, for example, people cut out the boundary at some place so does it this does this a capital a have to be exactly on the boundary or the true boundary or is it on the cutout so you mean the capital a does it have to be a boundary of a cft or it can be for example yeah, right. recent discussion yeah. it has been in, in in the bath or or something um right so in general we want to define the region unambiguously so that that's the main requirement so usually in uh, ADS CFT, the only way that you can define the region is to define it at a asymptotic boundary because that's the only place where you can define it uh, in a gauging variant way. Um, in this recent development of the black hole evaporation, 
you are coupling the gravitational bus, uh, gravitational bulk to a non-gravitating bus. So in that case, it's also well defined to compute the entropy of some region in the bus. And actually, that's the example that I'm going to talk about. Um, okay. So a priori, there's no reason uh, that you are not able to do that as long as you it's justified that you can neglect gravity in that region. Um, and then in that case, there is also some uh, similar. You, you can also apply the formula similar similarly there. Uh, I see. I I'm see. Going to talk about. It. Right. Okay. Okay. And uh, let me uh, just, uh, even though this won't be important uh, for my talk today, let me just mention that all of these formulas can be derived through the so-called gravitational path integral. And in the derivation of the island formula, certain space-time wormhole geometry are very important when you consider the gravitational path integral. Okay, so now let me illustrate all this idea by using a two-dimensional gravity example that I will use again and again in the, in the following talk. So let me spend some time to introduce you to the setup. So this two-dimensional gravity example uh, was introduced in a paper by our I'm Harry Mahajan and Malasena in uh, 2019. And it has two, di two different descriptions. So if we think of it as a holographic quantum system, the exact description of the model is simply uh, some quantum dot, namely a quantum mechanical system. You can think of it maybe as some sort of uh, SYK model, a quantum mechanical system with a large number of degrees of freedom coupled to a, a uh, one plus one dimensional CFT. So here I'm only drawing the spatial direction. So the CFT lives on a half infinite line, which attaches to this quantum me mechanical model. Now this model has a holographic dual or a semi-classical gravity description. Namely, this quantum mechanical system is replaced by an ATS2 space-time, as I'm drawing here in the, in the green region. So here I'm drawing the global uh, ADS2 space, while the physical part of the space-time co uh, uh, covers a Poincaré patch of the global ADS space. So namely, the physical part is the part that I'm shaded in, uh, that is within the triangle here. And the CFT um, is also here in the semi-classical description. It is simply a heat bath. That we they were carrying and uh, they were coupling the ADS2 space two. Okay. And so more concretely, here we are considering the JQ Tatabon gra gravity living in, in the ADS2 space time. So the the metric of the ADS2 space time is actually fixed and rigid. Namely, in the region where x is less than zero, the metric is simply the Poincaré metric of ADS2. And when x is greater than zero, the metric is simply the flat space metric in the bath. Okay? And there is no dynamical gravity living in the bath region. And in the JT gravity, there is one extra ingredient, which is the Dilaton field. So the Dilaton field phi uh, is infinity, goes to infinity near the boundary of ADS2 while it decreases towards the center of the bulk, okay? And it dies off with a one over X behavior. And uh, then you last, uh, is there a question? Yeah, uh, you, made, you made a comment about the exterior of the point carrier patch being unphysical. I didn't quite follow that. Can you explain? Oh, well, maybe maybe I, I, I'm using the wrong word. Uh, here, I'm simply saying that I, imagine you are an observer living okay. on the boundary. So your star, your star time is actually here and you, your time ends here. And if you just do ordinary okay. experiments, this is the region that you are, be, you are right. able to access. I, uh, yeah, I shouldn't say that this part of the space time is not there. It's not visible. Okay. I'm using okay. the word. Um, okay, very good. So the last ingredient in, in this setup is that there is a conformal field living in on the background with a central charge C. So I can take the field, field content to be general. And the boundary condition is such that the conformal field can just propagate out and inside the ADS2 space-time freely. 
basically because here the two metric just differs by a while scaling. So the conformal field doesn't really see that uh, change in the while scaling, as long as we, uh, we take the boundary condition to be transparent. Okay, so this is the basic setup. And let me say a few more words about the Dillerton field. So the Dillerton field, in particular, the constant piece of the Dillerton field phi naught uh, basically diagnoses the number of degrees of freedom for the quantum mechanical system. Namely, the you can think of the degrees of freedom n is basically scales as phi naught. And more generally, in the RT formula that I uh, reviewed earlier, we need to compute the area. But here, since we are living in two dimension, if we put pick a uh, the the area of a co-dimensional two surface naively is, is zero since, since it is only a point. But this is modified in Dillerton gravity since that if, if we think of Dillerton gravity as some dynamic, dim, dimensional reduction of higher dimensional gravity, the area in higher dimensions actually gets replaced by the value of the Dillerton field. So in other words, in the RT formula applied here, the area term is replaced by the Dillerton, the value of the Dillerton at, uh, at every point on the space time. Okay, so that will be important later. Now, let me uh, try to illustrate how to compute the entropy in, the, in, in this model. So, the, the, the simplest entropy that we can consider uh, is, is the entropy of this region. Okay. So we can compute the union of the quantum mechanical system, union with some small piece of the CFT. Let me call that zero to B, namely for starting from the quantum mechanical system up to some distant B, okay? So I'm I want to compute the entropy of this region here. And I want, it to com I want to compute it through gravity, namely I want to compute it in this picture. Now in this picture, following the RT prescription, we want to find the surface which I denote by the orange dot here that is homologous to the boundary. And now I need to take into account the area term that uh, sits at this orange dot, which here I'm writing as phi naught plus phi r over a, which follows from the equation that I wrote on the last slide. And also I need to take into account the entropy of the bulk quantum field. Now the bulk quantum field leaves uh, the entropy simply is the quantum field in this region from minus A to B, okay, within this region here. And I extremize over it. So after you extremize over it, you see, you actually find that, so you can change different value of A, and you actually see that there is a stream sitting at some particular value of A. And this formula gives you an IR finite entropy. So when I say IR finite, simply mean that other than the potential UV divergence coming from the boundary of the endpoint in the bus, there is no more divergence in the entropy. The entropy is, uh, is finite. Now, just as an exercise, we can also look at how to compute the entropy of a region from B to infinity. Now, from the quantum mechanical point of view, we know that this entropy should be just the same as the entropy of its complement, since we're here, we are imagining the whole state is in a pure state. So we know we should get the same answer. But the way that we actually get the same answer from the gravity point of view is actually interesting. So here I'm looking at the entropy from, uh, of the bath region from B to infinity. Naively, it will give me an inf infinite answer since here the quantum field, uh, well, he here we are considering an infinite region. And in quantum field theory, if we consider an infinite region, the, the entropy would have an IR divergence. Namely, it, it goes to infinity as we take this uh, volume of the region to infinity. So naively, it seems that I'm getting an infinite answer, which will contradict with the fact that from the quantum and mechanical point of view, I should get the same answer as my last slide. However, uh, what people realize is that it's important to take into account the possibility of, of islands. Namely, here I can consider an island just within the gravitational region. It tends from minus infinity to minus A, okay? Now, following the previous discussion, I need to take into account, again, the area term of the, 
at the boundary of the island, which is uh, this thing I'm writing here. And I now need to consider the entropy of the bulk quantum field. Now is living on the union of minus infinity to minus i and b to infinity. Okay, so I already need to compute the entropy of the quantum field on this entire region. And after that, I should extremize over the uh, over possible values of a. And once you do this exercise, you recover the exactly the same answer as last slide, which agrees with the. Uh, the fact that from the quantum mechanical point of view of the system is in a pure state. Now, let me con contrast these two calculations a little bit more. So we can say that if we just compute the coarse grain entropy, or if we naively compute the entropy in the semi-classical description of the region B to infinity, I will get infinite, and it's, it's IR divergent. However, if, if I compute the fine grain entropy, of this region B to infinity using the so-called uh, semi-classical gravitational formula. So it is again also compute within the semi-classical regime, but with a slightly different formula. I would actually get an IR finite uh, answer. The reason that it is IR finite, let me uh, just say a little bit more, is because here we're computing the bulk quantum field entropy from minus infinity to minus A and B to infinity, which is the same as the entropy from minus a to b. So it's uh, manifestly IR finite quality. Okay. So it's uh, remarkable that we can get the correct entropy from a, just a semi classical uh, calculation. So, more generally, um, if, even if we just consider a finite interval, finite but large interval, let's say a2 to b2 in the bus, uh, it's also possible to form island, and the island will also be some finite interval. Uh, within the ADS2 region. So one can show this explicitly. And in the evaporating black hole situation that I was alluded to, that actually people discussed this first, is that if you consider the entropy of the Hawking radiation very far away, you see that it's important to con con take into account the formation of iron in inside the black hole interior. And once you uh, take that into account, you recover the unitary page curve that I mentioned in the beginning. Hey, you mean? Uh, yes, please. I, uh, sorry, I, I think I have a stupid question. I, I think I missed something that you okay. said. So uh, in the previous slide. Um, this one, last one. Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, that one. So when you said you are computing the entropy of the B to infinity region, uh, then because the whole system is in pure state, the correct, I mean, that particular entropy should be equal to the entropy for minus infinity to B region, right? Yes. Okay. Well, um, it's important It's important whether you are talking about the entropy of the uh, quantum field in this semi-classical gravity description, or are you referring to the so-called fine grain entropy? namely the entropy. I'm talking about the fine grain entropy. The fine grain entropy, okay. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I think because the whole system is in pure state, you said that the B to infinity region, I mean, what I would have assumed is that the entropy for the B to infinity region is the same as from minus infinity to B region, right? Because they are... Uh, I'm, I, I, don't, I don't think that is correct to say that because yeah. if we want to talk about the fine grain entropy, we should really think about the exact description of the system. and there you would say that if I have the entropy of B to infinity, it is the same as complement, which is the quantum mechanical dot plus zero to B, okay? In this, in this, this is, the, the, this space-time picture here is merely a semi-classical description. So uh, if, you, if you just naively assume that the entropy of B to infinity equals to its complement, I think you will get the wrong conclusion. Ah, okay, okay, okay. So uh, it's um, correct to say that the uh, the entropy of the quantum fields from B to infinity is equal to the entropy of the quantum fields uh, from minus infinity to B, but the entropy of the quantum field is slightly different from the concept of the fine grain entropy of this region from B to infinity. Basically, when when we talk about the entropy of the quantum fields on the semi-classical background. We are just considering the coarse grain entropy of the quantum field. Namely, we are neglecting many uh, non particularly small contribution to the density matrix in that in, in the quantum field.
Mm. Uh, so, so <laughs> sorry. Uh, I hope we have enough time. Like, right, Nirmal? Uh, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, so, sorry. So, just uh, to make sure. So, uh, you said that for um, the entropy for the B2 infinity region, I should have expected it to be the one that you showed before, right? Two slides ago. Uh, and before that. Oh, before. Yes. Yeah, so why did you say that? Uh, because it's from zero to B region, I see. Uh, yeah, the, this is simply from the uh, holographic dual description. If mm -hmm. I compute the entropy of B to infinity, it's the same as its complement. Since here, right. the entire system, maybe I didn't say that, the entire system is put in the ground state. Right, right. And and this is the fine-grained entropy, right? All yeah, this is the fine-grained entropy. Yeah. So naively, the, the fine-grained entropy we can't naively we can't compute it using the semi-classical gravity picture. If we naively compute it, for example, compute the entropy of quantum fields on B to infinity, we get infinite, uh, which is the wrong answer. The right. surprise is that we can use a different formula to compute it, which doesn't look like uh, entropy in the first place, but it gives you the right answer. Okay. Are we assuming that the total, like the quantum mechanical point plus CFT is a pure state because otherwise two subsystems like might not have complement and that set might not have same entropies. Yes, yes, Fine. the entire system is in the in, in its ground state, is in a pure state. Okay. So, so in this um, right hand side, in this equation, uh, what is going on? So you have the, uh, this equation is the same as the equations two slides before, right? This one? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to explain this again? Is uh, mm -hmm. This is the area term, uh, mm -hmm. the boundary of the island. And once you have an island which extends from minus infinity to minus A, for the bulk quantum field entropy, we need to compute the entropy of the union of these two regions. Okay. Sorry, say that again, please. Oh. <laughs> yeah. uh, so Yes. And is the is the divergence of B to infinity and uh, in minus infinity to minus A getting cancelled? Yeah, exactly. Because because now you are basically consider a, 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 a infinite region which extends to infinity on both sides. Then its entropy is actually finite because if you look at its complement, the complement is from minus A to B, which is a finite region. So taking two divergent well. The yeah, in some sense, the divergence cancels. Um, he, oh, yeah. What was the minus a point again? Uh, Sorry, the minus a is the minus a is simply a, an arbitrary point in the bulk. Uh, so uh -huh. I, here I'm extremizing this. So this is a function of a. So given arbitrary value of a, you are giving me the point in the bulk. And then I add up the area and the bulk entropy, and then I extremize all, over all the possible values of A. So I change the change the position and look for extremum. And the uh, the the extremum gives me the entropy. That's uh, just uh, based on the RT formula. But this extremum A that you've got, this is also the same A which you must have had in the uh, first calculation, right? Yeah, exactly. Have... It's the same. It's the same. Yeah. Because you're extremizing the same function. Uh, exactly. yeah. Yeah. Once same. you have this island, then it becomes obvious that it will be the same. Yeah. OK. OK, I think we can proceed now. Yeah. OK. All right. Um... OK, so that's mostly a review. So I'm now about to, well, almost about to talk about uh, the internal wedge reconstruction. So semi-classical description secretly knows something more. It knows about the fine-grained information, namely the entropy. Now let's ask a different question. So imagine, so now uh, hopefully you now understand what, what this picture means. And uh, so this is a book. Uh, region in the bath a2 b2 and it contains an island a1 b1 okay the question is imagine we are observers in the bath region a2 and b2 now if we have only access to simple operators and we don't have 
uh, ability to do measurements with the e to the minus s accuracy, then all the things we are uh, able to uh, uh, access is the so-called coarse grain data. And of course, we should only learn things about things in the blue wedge. That is uh, just the simple statement of, uh, about causality that uh, we've been learning since uh, underwear. Okay. However, the striking consequence oh, sorry, of this recent discussion. Sorry, can you say it again? Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, sorry, sorry. Oh. Uh, now, if we do, if we are able to do arbitrary complicated measurements with e to the minus s accuracy, the question is, can we learn about the orange wedge or even manipulate things in the orange wedge, which looks very striking because it's a space-like region, uh, space-like to our original region. However, this recent discussion of islands would suggest that this is possible. And it is not a new concept. It is actually based on a much more well-established idea in holography, which is called the uh, entanglement wedge reconstruction. So now let me start, uh, let me talk a little bit about the entanglement wedge reconstruction idea. So the basic idea is actually very simple. So here I'm showing you again the RT formula. And the RT formula tells us one thing. If I change the bulk quantum field slightly in the bulk region A, little a, so change in the entanglement wedge A, it will reflect in the change of the boundary entropy as capital A, okay? So that tells you that you are just from the quantum information point of view, from the, the boundary data should contain whatever that is uh, happening in this in this orange region sorry i i, I i'm now calling the orange region the integral wedge so this orange shaded region is called the integral wedge of the boundary region a and the striking point is that the integral wedge usually is so it's always greater or equal to the causal wedge namely if we look at the boundary region a the causal wedge is, is bounded by this purple curve here, but the internal wedge can extend further. Namely, the RT surface it has to lie outside the causal wedge. So it encloses a larger bulk region. Also, in this case that, that I, I was talking about later, the causal wedge of the bulk region A to B2 is simply this blue diamond here. That's the region of the space time where you are able to access with just simple measurements. But the entanglement wedge is much larger. It, it goes from A1 to B1. And the standard idea in ADS-CFT is that in general, to access the entanglement wedge that is outside the causal wedge, you, are, you, you need to be able to do very complicated measurements with a very high accuracy. But it is in general uh, possible that suggested just by this entropy consideration. Another statement of uh, entanglement wedge reconstruction is that that won't be important actually in my talk is that for a low energy operator phi, a bulk operator phi in the internal wedge, one should be able to reconstruct it on the boundary as some operator O. Now there are various ways to uh, do carry out the internal wedge uh, reconstruction uh, explicitly. So here I'm just listing, uh, listing two particular ways. One is so-called path map and the other which I will utilize later is called the modular flow. Okay. And um, let me see. Okay. Now let me let me talk a little bit more about the modular flow idea or the modular Hamiltonian. Let me give you some background. So the entropy of the region A is simply written as the following is the minus trace of row A log rho A. And it can be written equivalently as the expectation value of the modular Hamiltonian Ka of region A. So what is the modular Hamiltonian? The modular Hamiltonian is nothing mysterious. It's simply defined as the minus logarithm of the density matrix, okay? So this is just a trivial rewrite, rewriting of the entropy. And, and, but an interesting thing is that if we consider a small variation of the state, so I start with some state and then I change it a little bit, the little change in the entropy 
is equal to the little change in the uh, expectation value of the modular Hamiltonian. Now, the the we can we can well we can apply this idea to the RT formula and apply this formula to both the boundary side and the bulk side. So if we consider a little variation of the state to the leading order in G Newton expansion, the area term wouldn't change, and we get the change of the expectation value of the boundary modular Hamiltonian will be now equal to the change of the expectation value of the bulk modular Hamiltonian. So this was first used in, by these authors to suggest uh, an inter interesting uh, relation between the boundary modular Hamiltonian and the bulk modular Hamiltonian. Namely, the boundary modular Hamiltonian is uh, in a semi-classical limit, basically a C number, namely the area divided by 4G Newton, which is, uh, which is simply to reproduce the entropy after you take the expectation value, plus the bulk modular Hamiltonian, K bulk, acting on the bulk fields, okay? Now, a concept that will be important later is the so-called modular flow. So the modular flow defining any quantum mechanical system is just a unitary evolution using the modular Hamiltonian as your Hamiltonian. So it's an evolution that is defined in your subregion A and you evolve it using the, uh, using the modular Hamiltonian K. The equality that we wrote down about the modular Hamiltonian is tells us something interesting. Namely, if we apply a modular flow on the boundary with boundary modular Hamiltonian Ka, in the semi-classical approximation, it is equivalent to a modular flow in the bulk in the integral wedge with the bulk modular Hamiltonian K, K bulk. In particular, if I start with the boundary operator O, and apply with the modular flow uh, Heisenberg evolution of this operator O on the boundary. In the bulk picture, basically what I'm doing is that I start with the dual of this operator O, which is phi, and then I apply the bulk modular Hamiltonian to, to that operator phi. Okay. This sounds a little bit more abstract, but uh, more accurately, the only thing that I will be using in this talk is a very basic uh, basic statement that namely for arbitrary state rho, arbitrary density uh, density matrix rho in the cold subspace, namely here cold subspace seems, simply means that I'm not, I'm considering all the states that it is very, very close to my initial state, to the state that I'm starting with, without back reacting the bulk geometry too far. And I would have the following equality. Namely, um, I can compute the expectation value of the modular flow operator on the boundary, and it is equivalent as computing the expectation value of the modular flow operator in the bulk. Okay, so it's simply a statement of the bulk modular flow equals to boundary modular flow. So this, this was discussed much before the island story uh, in the standard ABS CFT setup, but Basically, the point of my paper was to apply this idea to the new, new setup, which involves islands. Now, uh, I don't have time to go through this, but uh, this formula has a similar replica derivation, similar to how you derive the entropy, which was outlined in these papers by Faulkner et al. Now, if we, now, the previous few slides might seem a little bit abstract, but let me just uh, tell you again how it works in this specific example. So now, so I, yes. can I ask? Uh, so you mentioned there are two types of uh, component reconstructions: uh, yes. the pet map and uh, this one. So yes. do we know about whether they're equivalent, whether they're uh, not equivalent? Do yes. they give the well, same operator? Um, so, so I think my my idea, well, what I think is true is that they are actually doing slightly different things. I can comment on that uh, at the end, but uh, maybe I should defer that question to the end because I okay. have an extra slide for that. I can comment okay. on that. Okay. Um, so now, so if we return to our example, the region A2 and B2, so imagine I'm computing the entropy of the region A2 and B2, 
And as I mentioned, I will find an island in the bulk, which is A1 and B1. And the bulk quantum field entropy is defined on the union of the region A1, B1, and A2, B2. Now, this entropy formula naturally leads to a formula for the modular Hamiltonian. Namely, if I consider the modular Hamiltonian of A2 and B2 uh, of the boundary region, namely the exact modular Hamiltonian, in the semi-classical description, it is dual to the Dilaton field at the location of A1 plus at, at the location of B1 plus the bulk modular Hamiltonian, which is defined on the union of A1, B1, and A2, B2. So let me, so in my paper, I use this notation of the bold symbol and the, the ordinary symbol. So the bold K is supposed to mean the modular Hamiltonian of the boundary region, A to B2, which is supposed to be an exact modular Hamiltonian that is exactly defined from the quantum mechanical description. But this little K is simply a semi-classical modular Hamiltonian. It is defined just in the quantum fields living in the semi-classical background. But the interesting thing is that this uh, little k is defined not only on A2, B2, but also includes the island, namely it's on the union of A1, B1, and A2, B2, okay? So it's important to distinguish these two modular Hamiltonians. In the usual ADS-CFT setup, this will be like the modular Hamiltonian of the boundary region of, uh, of in your CFT, this is like the modular Hamiltonian in the bulk, okay? All right. Uh <clears throat> Yes. Uh, just a second. Uh, in that, uh, are you missing the extremization on this first equation? So here I already did the ex extremization. So okay. This is the final result. So I have some specific A1 and B1. All right, right, right. right. Okay. Yeah. All right. So <clears throat> let me just make some more comments about modular Hamiltonia and modular flow because I'm not sure people will be uh, familiar with this. So the modular Hamiltonian or in the condensed matter community, it's also sometimes called the entanglement Hamiltonian. As I said, it's simply the minus logarithm of the density matrix. <coughs> Sorry. Generally, it is a very complicated and non-local operator in A, because imagine that you take your complicated density matrix and take a logarithm. It's a horrible operator that is very non-local. But there are actually some very special local cases, namely the modular Hamiltonian becomes simple. So one such particular case is that if we consider a quantum field in the vacuum state in Minkowski space time, and we take consider the modular Hamiltonian of a half space, okay, namely the space from zero to infinity, the modular Hamiltonian here is simply the boost generator that generates the boost in the uh, right uh, ring ring wedge. So it's a it's a local operator that you can just write down using the stress tensor. Another interesting local case is that if we consider a conformal field theory and we consider a single interval of the conformal field theory. So here I'm drawing the causal diamond of that single interval. Basically because that here we can do a conformal mapping and map it to the half space that I talked about. The modular Hamiltonian of this single interval is also local. Namely, it can be expressed as a local integral of the stress tensor in the time direction with some profile function fx. So under this modular flow, if you start with some operator here, the operator under the flow would, would basically be transported along this red line. Okay, If you start with operator here, it will be transported along that red, red line. It's basically a geometric flow in this local case. However, Going beyond this, uh, these two cases, there are very little that is known about these complicated operators in quantum field theory. There are some, some known examples though for multi-interval cases. For example, for the two-dimensional massless free fermion that I will be talking about later, there is an explicit uh, expression for arbitrary n intervals. So you can consider here, I'm drawing two intervals, but you can consider many intervals. And there is an explicit uh, formula for the modular Hamiltonian. For massless scalar field, um, I think, to my knowledge, we, we only know the explicit uh, expression for up to two intervals. And the key property of the modular Hamiltonian that will be important is the non-localness of the modular Hamiltonian. Namely, if you have a quantum field that is, uh, so if I consider the subregion which includes 
two disjoint intervals, the modular Hamiltonian of the union would couple operators in the first interval to the operators in the second interval. So it couples, it talks between the between them. Okay. And that's the uh, crucial property that I will be utilizing. Now let me finally can tell you about what the what I actually did. Uh, the idea now let me let me let me tell you how the how you can really apply the modular flow idea to entanglement wedge reconstruction. So let's imagine the following setup just to be very concrete. Suppose someone living in the island perturbed the state by acting with a unitary uh, in the island. So someone in the island act with e to the minus epsilon of phi i times x zero. So here I'm taking epsilon to be some small number so I don't perturb the state too much. Now, of course, as someone who lives in the in the bus, I cannot detect it with simple measurement phi b. So this is, of course, demanded just by causality in the semi-classical theory, because I'm living in a space-like region. I, I couldn't really tell what happens there if there is a unitary operator active there. But let me just make it more, uh, more explicit. In terms of formula here, what I'm saying is that if I have some simple operator phi b, and I compute the expectation value of phi b in this perturbed state and the original state, the difference is zero. So I couldn't tell the difference. Or the difference is some exponentially suppressed uh, quantity that you cannot see in the semi-classical description. By exponentially suppressed, I mean suppressed as e to the minus s. Well, s is the black hole entropy. From the quantum mechanical point of view, what this is saying is that even though by the standard uh, idea of integral wedge reconstruction, we know that this operator phi i should correspond to some operator in the region A2, B2, just by the, by the uh, statement of integral wedge reconstruction. But this phi i is an operator that is very, very complicated and cannot be detected with uh, simple measurements with limited accuracy. So you can't really tell whether this, this perturbation is active in, in this region or not by just using simple measurements. However, now let me apply a modular flow on the state on, on the state with the exact modular Hamiltonian case. So let me do a unitary evolution in this uh, in this boundary region A two B two in this bath region A two B two with the modular Hamiltonian. In the bulk description, so using the equivalence of boundary and bulk modular flow, in the bulk description it is equivalent as doing a modular flow but with the bulk modular Hamiltonian, which is the Hamiltonian that is defined on the union of A1, B1, and A2, B2. Okay, so I'm now in the semi-classic description, I'm evolving the state with the modular Hamiltonian that is defined on the union of orange and blue. And if I start with the operator in the island, the modular flow operator, which I define, uh, which I denote by phi i x zero and tau, where well, tau is the flow parameter, it will be supported on both intervals. It would have some support in the orange region and also some support in the blue region. The region, uh, the reason of that is that I, I mentioned the important property of the modular Hamiltonian in general is that it is non-local. It couples operator between the intervals. Okay. So if you start with some operator here, it will get, be transported to, to, to there as well. And since now you have an operator that is supported just within your causal wedge, you are now able to, to see this perturbation by just using simple measurements. Namely, in this modular evolved state, I should the expectation value of phi b should be different from what it is previously. Now let me again make this very, very, uh, very slowly and precise. So here I'm, I want to compute the expectation value of some simple operator phi b in the modular flowed state. Now from the first line to the second line, I replaced the boundary modular flow by the bulk modular flow. So I used the uh, equality of the boundary and bulk modular flow and replaced it by the bulk modular flow, okay? Replaced by little k. Uh, the, by the usual k and <clears throat> and okay so here i'm computing this expectation value 
And since here, the Heisenberg, evol uh, the Heisenberg evolution of the operator phi i would now have support in region A2 and B2, namely this operator that I'm writing here will have support now in both regions. I'm not able to tell, it, tell the difference using just uh, a simple observable phi b, and it would not be the same as the original uh, expectation value where I didn't have such uh, perturbation. Now, where did I use uh, quantum gravity effect in this argument? The quantum gravity effect only comes in through the first step, namely it only comes in when I relay the uh, boundary modular Hamiltonian or the exact modular Hamiltonian with its bulk description, okay? So I, when I replace capital K by little k, I use the, the quantum gravity idea. However, from the second line to the third line to the fourth line, I'm only using field theory in the bulk. So it's just some semi-classical thing. <clears throat> from a, we can also think about this from the boundary uh, perspective. Now, this operator phi i, as I mentioned before, is a very complicated operator. That's why I wasn't able to tell you using simple measurement in the first place. But what I'm proposing is that by acting with a modular flow with, uh, with uh, this exact modular Hamiltonian, we are pulling out some simple operators from phi i so that I cannot detect it. Of course, the exact modular Hamiltonian k itself is a very, is supposed to be a very complicated operator because, because it is <clears throat> the difference of this modular, exact modular Hamiltonian k and the a modular Hamiltonian of the quantum fields in this region is precisely those intricate correlation of the Hawking radiation that is missing in Hawking's calculation or in the semi-classical description. So it serves a complicated operator, and I, I don't actually have a, I don't actually know how to derive this operator. Uh, hi, Yi Ming. Uh, yes. Sorry again. So uh, this uh, bold K is for the CFT uh, part, the bars yes. part of the modular Hamiltonian, but that yes. is uh, the the local expression, right? I mean, it's not complicated. No, no, sorry. Well, so maybe, yeah, let me make this distinction again. So this K is a K that is defined in this exact dual description, okay? The local thing that you are talking about is the uh, the modular Hamiltonian of the bulk quantum fields in the semi-classical description. So a priori, the two are again different. The, the difference- no, no, sorry, sorry. Uh, I'm not talking about any semi-classical anything. I'm just talking about a CFT vacuum state. Okay, you okay. Know, I know the modular Hamiltonian for that. Okay, okay. That yes. A2B2 region is only in that CFT region. Uh, but here the CFT is not already in the vacuum because here you are picking some special boundary condition. If it's like an infinite line, then then you are absolutely correct. Okay, but so that's what it makes the world get complicated. It's coupled to this quantum mechanical system in some complicated way. So this okay, okay. Hamiltonian is actually uh, complicated. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And uh, kind of a related question. Okay, this is now clear to me. And kind of a related question. So, of course, in these equations, your input is the island formula. The one you showed that bold yes. K is equal to uh, usual K. But is there like a, a purely modular uh, Hamiltonian theoretic way of uh, understanding, uh, for example, how is it happening in terms of some uh, in terms of some modular flow? Like uh, you know, when I have the usual ADS CFT, so in CFT I have some killing vectors, and those killing vectors are naturally extended to the entanglement wedge in the ADS mm -hmm. uh, in a very local fashion. So, uh, okay, so here you, you will probably say that, of course, I don't have that because of some complicated quantum gravity corrections. Uh, yeah, well, here we are not in such an ideal situation where you have some killing symmetry. So I'm not sure. Yeah, that, yeah, no, of course not. But, um, okay, but probably you won't also say much about that, right? Uh, no, I, I don't think I would. Like how how do the how do the maybe not local but the modular flow can in A two B two modular flow can now relate to the A two B two union A one B one modular flow. Uh, no, I, I won't have more to say about how they are really related. 
But I, in the following, I will tell you what the modular flow of A1B1 and A2B2 really look like. Have okay. some specific theory. That's what I'm going to talk about. Okay. okay. And uh, let me just conclude this part by saying that K itself is a complicated operator. The perspective here is very simple. It's simply that this special complicated operator provides a general way to extract information from the island. Namely, this complicated operator can turn complicated operator into simple operators. So that's the main non-trivial statement, because usually if you evolve some complicated thing using complicated thing, you expect to get complicated thing again. But here, the special thing is that it can, uh, it can uh, pull out some simple parts from the complicated operator. Uh, OK. So now let me uh, just spend a few more minutes to talk about the uh, very nice example that I think is interesting in its own right. Uh, not not really uh, is interesting even without application to the uh, to this uh, reconstructing problem is the modular flow for two dimensional free masses fermion and it's discussed in this very beautiful paper by Cassini and Welta. So I, I I definitely would like to tell you a little bit about it if you have not seen it before. So the setup is that I want to consider the modular flow for two dimensional free masses fermion. So it's uh, possibly the simplest quantum field theory. So the fermion, since it's massless in two dimension, it just decomposes into left and right going modes, right? It travels the speed of light and it is separates into two parts. And so does the modular Hamiltonian. So the modular Hamiltonian would just couple right going modes to right going mode and left going mode to left going mode. So you can, uh, we can just focus on one of them, let's say K plus or K minus. Another simplica simplification is that since here we are dealing a free theory, let's say we consider the vacuum state. The vacuum state is a Gaussian state, namely all the higher point function factorizes by weak contraction into uh, two point functions. And the modular Hamiltonian would have such a property that is quadratic in the field variable. So here it is simply Poisson dagger Poisson uh, multiplied by some kernel function, which I denote by H here, okay? So in general, it's a, it's a uh, it's an integral of two variables, the coordinate of the first fermion, the coordinate of the second fermion, uh, and, and there is a kernel in between, h u1 and h u2. Now, just based on this general uh, structure, so this works in general, as long as you are dealing with a Gaussian state or maybe the vacuum state, um, under a modular flow, if you start with some fermion operator, since it's quadratic, the Heisenberg evolution of using this operator K will simply evolve into a single operator into a linear combination of uh, many Fermi operators, okay? Many single Fermi operators. So that's the general structure we we expect. But actually in this fermion case, the there is a further simplification that is really beautiful. So let me try to tell you about that. Um, now, of course, for the single interval case, I already told you, the single interval case, since this is a CFT, if we consider a single interval, the modular Hamiltonian is completely local. So namely here, the H, uh, I think is probably, uh, I think here, if you have a single interval, the H is just proportional to some delta function. So it just couples the, it just transports the some Fermi operator along the red line, okay? And in particular here, since I'm, uh, projecting the fermions into a left moving and right moving. If you really look at the right moving coordinate or the left moving coordinate, it's simply transporting the fermion along the null directions in, in this one dimensional line. So this is completely determined by conformal symmetry. Now, the interesting thing that was pointed out by, by them is that if you have two disjoint intervals, there are two things that happens. First, now this kernel H, I, I can separate it into two pieces. The first piece is the local piece, and the second piece is the non-local piece, okay? So the local term is completely analogous to what I had in my last slide, but the only effect when you have two disjoint intervals is that these trajectories get a little bit deformed compared to what they, had, what they were before, okay? So the trajectory are slightly deformed. But 
if you only have this local term, the fermion operator still stays on this trajectory. But the most interesting thing here is the a very special property of the non-local term. They find that the non-local term is not entirely non-local. It is what they call quasi-local. Namely, it couples one trajectory in the left diamond to one particular trajectory on the right diamond. So let's here I'm drawing like this trajectory gets only coupled to this trajectory. And the, this second trajectory gets coupled to this trajectory. So the trajectory get pairwise coupled. So for example, if I start with the fermion operator here, I will only be coupled to a fermion operator at some particular point, at the point here on the right wedge, but not to any other point, okay? So that's why it's, it's even though it becomes non-local, but it's quasi-local. And it gives you a very nice property of the modular flow. Namely here, imagine that I'm uh, evolving this Fermi operator using the modular Hamiltonian. Now it's the union of the two interval. And sometime after some flow parameter tau, this operator that is originally in the left diamond would now become a linear combination of two operators. It won't be become a linear combination of many operators. Now in, in this case, it will just be two operators, one in the left and one in the right. Okay, and they have some coefficient, which here I'm writing as cosine theta and sine theta. And this function tangent theta basically gives you a way to quantify how much of the operator gets transferred to the second interval. So at tau equals to zero, tangent theta is just zero. So the operator is entirely in the left, but after a while, part of it gets transported to the right and tangent theta gives you a quantifier how much it is in the right. Now, one can derive what the tangent theta is really is, um, and you find that it is actually, it doesn't really go to infinity. So the operator never gets completely transferred, transferred to the right, but it's upper bounded by, the, by some function of the cross ratio, okay? So this is not important here. The important thing is that when the two interval gets very close, the cross ratio is defined such that the cross ratio becomes very large. Then an operator on the left in the limit where the intervals are very close can be almost completely transferred to the interval on the right. And this is not difficult to see. We can consider the limit where the two intervals actually just joins together. Then the modular Hamiltonian of the union of the two should just approach the modular Hamiltonian of the of the larger system, which is the entire diamond, like the modular Hamiltonian of the, of the larger subregion. And as I tell you earlier, that that modular Hamiltonian should be a local modular, uh, modular flow, should generate a mod local modular flow. Namely, if I start with the operator on the left, it would follow basically this trajectory. So initially it's in the left region after it projected on the light cone coordinate, but after a while, it will be entirely in the right region. So this explains why in the limit where the two intervals get very close, you can basically transport one from the left to the right, okay? Now, we can just uh, apply this idea, uh, this, this simple, well, simple idea to, to our setup to make it more concrete. What we have is that Initially, let me imagine that I start with the fermion. So imagine that I couple this JT gravity to a two-dimensional CFT, which just uh, involves uh, such a free massless fermion field, which is a reasonable assumption since like in, in real world, the Hawking radiation is essentially free field. Um, well, so I start with the fermion operator in the lab region, and now I apply a modular flow uh, in the bulk, then, what I will get is two Fermi operators, one in the bath, one in the island, and one in the bath region. Okay. And here you can compute explicitly what the cross ratio is in this explicit example. And you'll see that the cross ratio is actually very large. Namely, you can almost transport this operator entirely into the bath. <clears throat> in the quantum mechanical picture, of course, 
this or originally this fermion operator will be some very uh, complicated operator in the in the bath region, but the idea is that under a modular flow, we are pulling out some simple pieces. We we, we here I draw it as two dots because uh, this single fermion operator actually has two components: one left moving and run right moving. And if you draw it on the t equals to zero time slice, there are actually two points. Okay. So uh, originally you can think of it as uh, some very complicated operator, which is a, like a cloud of operators there. But after the modular flow, there are two simple operators that em emerges. Okay, so I don't have time to talk more about this, but you can also play, uh, is there a question? Yeah, in the previous slide, so are you saying that irrespective of what kind, whatever, non-local operator that you had taken. If you evolved using modular flow under this particular uh, kind of, uh, for this 2D massless CFT uh, for fermions, you would get only two uh, points. I Is would, you... uh, well, so first of all, the exact modular Hamiltonian is not, not simple, okay? So I don't know the setback of all this discussion is, of course, I can't really give you an explicit form of the exact mode. Yeah, that's But in this uh, uh, semi-classical picture, you have yeah. that non-bold K. Okay. That's the normal K would, yes, that I know. That would just be the, the mode Hamiltonian for the union of these two intervals. And it would, uh, under that flow, if you start with the operator here, it will be an operator supported on, on both both points. Right. Okay. So in this diagram that you have, you uh, it seems that if you had not just one point initially and had a cloud, even then if you evolved using this normal K, you would have got only two points at the end. Is that what you're saying? Are you referring to this picture here? Yes, right. Yeah. So this cloud that I'm drawing here is supposed to denote this original operator because this operator is entirely in the island. So okay. think of it okay. from the quantum real point of view is some very complicated operator, which I cannot see by simple measurement here, just based on causality. causality. And uh, what I'm drawing here is that after a while, after you modular flow it, the remarkable thing is that there are some simple pieces that start to emerge. These two pieces are correspond to the same point here. Uh, the only reason there are two points here is because this operator is, is actually the sum of the left moving and the right moving component. So there are actually two points here. Okay. And there are still some, you see, there are still some pink cloud left that's like the remaining operator here. Okay. Um, yeah, that's not completely removed. I see, all right, thank you. Okay, that's a great question. And uh, I, I don't have time ready to go into the detail of this, but you can play the same game for two-dimensional free massless scatter, even though this is not really in my paper, but uh, you can look at what you get in this case. So the idea is that, you, well, so this is just a quantum field theory calculation. So you start with the two regions like these, you start with the operator that originally is on, on the left, and we want to see whether it can be transported to the right region or not under the modular flow of the union of the two interval. Here I have a <clears throat> here I have a, a, a cartoon. So let me first explain. The orange dotted lines are the boundaries of the two regions. So as you can see here, I'm taking the two regions to be very close to each other. And originally this delta function peak is the operator that I originally started with. And what I'm plotting here is some uh, some weight function, uh, some profile function, okay? And if it is free fermion, what you would expect is that it will stay a delta function, but after you flow, you will have two delta functions, one in the left and one in the right. That's the free fermion case that I'm talking about earlier. But in the free scalar field, it's actually uh, slightly different. So you actually see that is it becomes completely non-local. Like here is no longer a delta function, but you can still see that most of it gets transported to the right. When it's very close to the boundary, the numerical, so this you need to compute numerically. 
when it's very close to the boundary, the numerical simulation becomes uh, not very good. So I'm not sure what happens after that. <clears throat> okay, so let me skip over this. This is not very important. And uh, let me mention that in the same paper by Amhari Mahajan and Madosina, they also discussed the two time, uh, a two-sided black hole example that are somewhat uh, more similar to the standard black hole evaporation setup. And in, uh, in other words, you're considering an ADS2 space-time, uh, which is now a two-sided black hole, and you couple it to the a bath on the left and the bath on the right. And what they find is that if you consider some subregion, which is a union of the left bath and the right bath, you also find an island, uh, you find an island, and here the island is outside the horizon. Okay, I mean the endpoint is outside the horizon. So an orange blob here, and you can apply the same technique that I mentioned also there, and uh, uh, you, you don't need to look at it. And the important thing here is that here as you go towards the late time you naturally also have the cross ratio much greater than the one at late time so you can also efficiently transport operators in the island to operators in the bath using modular uh, evolution now let me end with some uh, comments and some questions of course the major question is well, why, why, why doesn't this violate causality or locality? You are telling me that you can do something to uh, affect a region that is space-like. Now, let me emphasize that in the exact quantum mechanical description of the system, namely I have a quantum mechanical dot plus a CFT bus, there is no causality issue since the operator that I'm trying to pull, pull out is already, already in this region, okay? is already in this region. And what I'm doing is simply applying uh, unitary evolution in the same region. And the only thing I'm doing is to turn the originally very complicated heady operator into some simple operator. So that's the only thing that happens in the, in the exact description. In the semi-classical description, there's also, again, no contradiction with causality because I'm now evolving the the system with a modular Hamiltonian that is defined on the union of the two interval. So is the, the, the evolution I'm applying is non-local to begin with. There is only a question once we go to, perhaps there is a third picture, which is a non-perturbative uh, non non gravity picture. But since we don't have a clear understanding of how to think about that, uh, how to think about gravity non perturbatively uh, I don't have any comments along that line. But within the uh, the descriptions that we are more familiar with, there is no contradiction with uh, uh, causality. Now, uh, of course, as I alluded to, it would be nice to have a more uh, better understanding of a non perturbative gravity description. This is, of course, not just the problem uh, along the line of my work. This is a general problem in the field. How to think about ready the Hawking evaporation process from a more non perturbative point of view. Um, now, one thing that might be interesting to look at is to study more carefully the form of the exact modular Hamiltonian, perhaps in some toy models, let's say in a SYK model coupled to bath or in some quantum circuit model, because it seems that the, exactly how the exact modular Hamiltonian differs with the, just the coarse grain modular Hamiltonian would be very important in making this story work. And it might have something to say with uh, uh, the intricate correlation in the Hawking radiation, or in, in this case, in the bath region. Now, you may wonder whether this can be put into the practical use. Imagine the future civilization is able to, uh, um, would they be able to rescue someone uh, from the black hole interior using this protocol? Of course, as many people from the past, also in recent years, have pointed out, such protocol is, is likely to have very, very high complexity. So it's, it's likely to be very difficult to carry out in a, in a real life situation. But I think one interesting point is that this seems to be a, a very non-trivial uh, thing that, that is good to test 
of it, it can serve as a test of this quantum gravity idea through some simulation, for example, in a future quantum computer or maybe in a tabletop experiments. Because if you think of this phenomena from the quantum mechanical point of view, it's really non trivial. It tells you that if you start with some very complicated KD operator and after the modular flow, which is also a complicated operation, you are getting something simple in the end, which is a priori not obvious at all from the quantum mechanical system point of view. Uh, so I think that's maybe something to think more about, perhaps along the line of just uh, many body physics or quantum mechanical system. Okay. And uh, of course, there are many more technical issues that I think are still interesting to uh, investigate further. One thing that seems interesting uh, that, that arose in this talk is that there seems to be some generic property of the modular Hamiltonian or modular flow. When you take two disjoint intervals, but uh, push them to be very close to each other, it seems that the modular flow in that limit has to converge to the has to converge to the geometrized modular flow when, when you are already having a single interval, okay? So I wonder, uh, one, one question would be whether this can be more made more pre precise. And of course, there are many other questions about modular flow, for example, how to define it, the higher orders in the G Newton expansion, what happens if you have excited states rather than vacuum states, and what happens when you have interactions. And that's, uh, I think, what I want to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Iming, for that very excellent talk. That was very clear. So we will start uh, with questions, and I have a few. So first of all, uh, let me ask this. So you said that uh, unless they have these uh, uh, intervals are very close, some of the initial perturbation remains in the A1, B1 side. Yes. So does it mean that we cannot fully reconstruct the perturbation? Um, no, no. Well, so there is a distinction, I think, uh, in what I'm doing here and the usual statement of entanglement wedge reconstruction. So here, I um, maybe there's no particular slide I want to show, but let me see. Here, I'm doing something very simple. I'm just doing a Heisenberg evolution using the modular flow and ask what happens. Okay, but mm -hmm. in general modular, uh, in general internal wedge reconstruction, you are allowed to also maybe act with some operator outside and evolve it using the modular Hamiltonian, and you are also uh, allowed to take various linear superposition of mm -hmm. the modular flow with different flow parameter. So you are you are allowed to do much more general things. So if you are allowed to do those, then you can always reconstruct an operator inside in terms of operators outside and the modular Hamilton. Okay. So uh, a question related to causality. Is that yeah. Suppose I have a situation where I am doing some kind of experiment in the bulk. Okay. And yes. then uh, the question is whether I can uh, find the result of that experiment from the A to B2 uh, thing by doing uh, mm -hmm. entanglement wedge reconstruction. Because if I, if I can do that, it would seem that there has been some information transfer at uh, space-like separation. Yes. So yes, can, I... can I do that or is it? Um, yeah, I think you, well, I, I, I think you can, for example, because here uh, earlier, basically what I argue is that you have some a unitary uh, evolution in the in the island, you can use the modular flow to pull it out. More generally, as you say, using integral wedge reconstruction to reconstruct it in the A to B two region. Now you are talking about some measurement process, but in general, the measurement is simply the some unitary evolution involving your system and some uh, measurement apparatus, and the, well, the entire thing you can reconstruct it. So I don't see a, a reason why you can't. Uh, reconstruct the measurement result outside. But th that would uh, mean that I have information about some experiment that happened. You know, I, I got the inf uh, information at some superluminal speed. No, but again, as I emphasize in the semi-classical description, in the bulk description that we are talking about here, uh -huh. the 
modular flow is is a non-local operator, so it's reasonable that you can uh, you you can move things from inside to outside, even though there are space lag. Because I'm really acting an operator that is in the semi-classical description. I'm really really acting an operator that is defined on the union of the two interval. So in in a way, it's uh, breaking the uh, classicality. Semi, it's not uh, somehow it's not semi-classical anymore. Would that be right statement? No, I don't think that's the right statement. This, so I still you have using entanglement, right? The semi-classical description does not break down uh, completely. The semi so. Basically, the idea is the following. When, when, when the island story first came out, of course, many people were talking about this idea of reconstructing things in the island. And the general, I think the general expectation was that if you want to do that, you have to go beyond semi-classical. Uh, well, you, the semi-classical picture has to break down in order to do that in general. But I think the main point of this paper is to show that you there is a protocol where you apply a modular flow uh, exact modular flow in the boundary region, but it has a still has a very nice semi-classical description. So I'm still using the concepts of like quantum fields in the fixed background. But the the interesting thing is that in the semi-classical description, the flow operator is no longer a local operator. It is actually an operator that is on both region A1, B1, and A2, B2. But the semi-classical picture doesn't break down. Is still within the low energy effective field theory. Right. Okay, so my last question was about again the PETS map, which you promised. Okay, yeah. come back. I have a slide on that. Yes. I, I, I don't have too much to say on this because a priori there is no reason they have to agree. And I, I think they are doing slightly different things. So the PETS map is telling you maybe ignore this picture. Um, well, the PETS map is telling you that if you want to reconstruct, uh, an operator in the island, you basically take the operator on the on on the boundary and you trace out the rest of the well. So they, let me make this statement. Okay, let's imagine the following following setup. Let's let's send in the fermion from infinity to the quantum dot. Okay, in the semi classical description, the fermion since it's a transparent boundary condition. The fermion will just fly into the island. So for some duration of time, it is in the island. And the statement of internal wedge reconstruction tells me that once it is in the island, I should be able to reconstruct it from the uh, from the path region A2 and B2. So now let's ask how exactly this can happen. If in the quantum mechanical point of view, if this operator under Heisenberg evolution, it really stays in the quantum mechanical dot, then of course. I, there's no way that I can reconstruct it here. What already happens is that since the quantum dot is coupled to the bus, there is some very tiny component of the operator that is not entirely in the quantum mechanical dot, but is also in the CFT. And in particular, this operator would have some support in the region A2 and B2. Okay. okay. And the path map story tells you that if I want to construct this operator in the island, I simply need to take simply uh, just need to take the, this operator and trace out whatever that is outside my region A2 and B2, and that operator would be the bulk due of this operator uh, would be the boundary due of this operator in the island. So that's the pass map story, maybe the mm -hmm. pass light story, uh, in, in in their paper, and now the modular flow does something it, it does something different. So the modular flow story starts with this operator in, in the region A2 and B2 and tries to make that complicated operator into a simple operator, okay? So mm -hmm. it's kind of a second step after the pass map. So the pass map only tell you that, well, you, you can have this operator, but it will be some complicated operator and difficult mm -hmm. to work with. And the modular flow idea lets you to translate that complicated operator into some simple operator, because I'm telling you that after you apply some uh, modular flow, you are turning the originally complicated operator into simple ones. So I think the two are doing 
actually different steps of the story. Right? I see. Okay. Okay. Oh, thanks. So, uh, any other questions? Yeah, actually, uh, I had, uh, okay. Sorry. Go ahead. Is there is there any analogous thing to complementarity? Like, can we say that the black hole interior information can be either observed in the interior, or uh, you can observe the copy in the radiation? You can't observe both. Or can we use some kind of wormholes to observe both copies of the interior information? Well, um, well, I. Yeah, I haven't thought too carefully about about this problem. Um, let me see. Naively, I would think that you can observe both because you can, if you have something in the island, you can first use the modular flow and move it outside and observe it once, and then apply the modular flow and move it back, and then you fall into the black hole and observe it twice. Um, I don't see why that can't happen, but the I think the upshot here is that the um, the degrees of freedom inside the island is not really independent from the degrees of freedom in the bot from the exact quantum mechanical point of view. So there is no uh, cloning paradox or anything like that. Maybe that's what you're referring to. Okay, so there is no cloning paradox. Okay then. Yeah, based yeah. on this, the the idea of this internal wedge reconstruction story is that it's not really independent degrees of freedom. All the things are originally already in this in this uh, region A two and B two. It's just complicated versus simple. That's the main difference. And I I, I will have to go in, in, in two or three minutes. I'm really sorry, but I have something at nine thirty in my time. Okay, so maybe, uh, yeah, urgent questions, maybe two two questions. Yeah, maybe let's just take one last question and uh, maybe yeah, I'll not ask. Uh, maybe just one reference. Uh, do you know that uh, this uh, union of subregion things uh, for the corresponding modular Hamiltonian had that been calculated in some other arbitrary states other than vacuum state? Not, not that I know of. I think I only know the these concrete results in vacuum state and uh, um, uh, in free fermion and free scalar. But maybe you can ask. Well, you could ask, for example, in the thermal state, or let's say, uh, you, maybe you put the theory not in an infinite line or in a cylinder. There might be some discussions like that. Uh, the, the the corresponding modular Hamiltonian is uh, still minus log of rho of the union of the two regions, right? That's how it is defined. Sorry, can you say that again? Yes. So if I have two uh, union of two subregions, then the corresponding modular Hamiltonian is minus log of rho of the two, two. union of the two. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's important that is the lo minus lo rho of the two rather than just minus log of the row of the first minus log of the row of the second. So it's not like taking them separately and sum them up. It's ready the log of the entire thing. Only then you you got this quantum entanglement, you got these non-local non-local terms. Uh, that's very yeah, important. Row of A union B, right? Yeah, exactly. Row of A union. And that has been uh, calculated in some papers as well. No? Uh I think the the, maybe the starting point would be this paper. If you want like to learn a little bit about it, it would be this paper by Cassini and Weta. Which That's, year is this? Which year? This was in 2009, if I remember correctly. 2009, OK. Yes. All right, thank you. You can find, it in, 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 find the reference in my paper if you want. OK. OK, thanks a lot, Yiming, for the talk. Thank you. And uh, yeah, uh, okay. we'll close now. So thanks again. Thank you.